Good morning. It's Thursday, February 18th, and we are beginning our day working on H96, which is an act relating to the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force. And this bill was brought forward this year as a bill. Last year, we worked on um, this concept as a committee bill. And it was to be um, done in relation to JRH2, which is the eugenics apology. One of the things I've mentioned this before, one of the things that um, we learned last year was you can't just apologize for something. You need to do something concrete. And, um, and this was the first this is the first um, attempt at doing something concrete in conjunction with the apology. And this task force would be formed. Well, I'll let Damien go through the short form bill and then discuss what we did last year on it and um, the steps we would need to move forward on this bill over the next couple of weeks. So with that, Damien, welcome back. Good morning. Let me turn off my mute. Um, so uh, I will just take us right over to the bill and walk you through it. It's a very short walkthrough, and then we can uh, discuss and answer any questions. So just okay. So, uh, like the chair mentioned, it's a short form bill. Uh, so the text has been left out, um, but the bills. Uh, purpose is to create the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force, which I know is a mouthful. Um, and that that task force would develop and submit to the General Assembly a proposal for legislation to create one or more Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present. Um, so before I move on there, I think an important thing to note that came out of last year's discussion is that uh, the issues around eugenics and other historic discrimination in the state are not one dimensional and don't affect just one group. So what this uh, bill leaves open is the possibility of developing uh, multiple truth and reconciliation commissions, if that's the most appropriate way to move forward um, and to address uh, the, the issues that the task force um, sort of focuses in on. Uh, the task force would be composed of both voting and non-voting members. The voting members of the task force would include representatives of historically dis disadvantaged or disenfranchised groups that have suffered from institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in the state. Um, and then the non-voting members would include legislative members. Uh, so there's a couple of um, important things to note here. The first is by structuring it this way, with non-voting legislative members, it would allow the task force to take advantage of legislative staff. Um, so, uh, for example, for drafting legislation, they could use legislative counsel to help develop the report of the task force with a legislative proposal, uh, which would help <clears throat> move things along when the proposal is submitted to the General Assembly. The other piece here uh, that um, that's worth talking about is the way it's set up with the legislative members not voting on the actual um, uh, direction that the task force decides to go in. And the idea here that the sponsors had was to basically give a voice to these disenfranchised groups and how they want these truth and reconciliation commissions to be set up so that it, it is not, um, it's not a situation where, uh, individuals who potentially uh, are not from those disadvantaged groups are telling the disadvantaged groups what's best for them. Um, so it's, it's giving the disadvantaged groups an opportunity to have a voice in what the best way to move forward with the healing process for their group is. Um, so that, that's the idea here. Uh, and that's it 
for the bill. So I'll stop the screen share and I'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, Representative Parsons. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, if that's a, a process of how you explained kind of there's the legislative members have no voting authority. However, the commission is still allowed to use the legislative council. I was just curious if that's a any if that um, framework, I guess, has been used before. It's a good question. I'm not sure um, if this sort of uh, non-voting legislative member framework has been used uh, in the past. Um, I know we've had a mixed legislator, non-legislator study committees. Sometimes they do use legislative staff, sometimes they don't. Um, by using legislative members, you open up the possibility of using legislative staff if that's the direction the committee decided to take this bill in. Um, and it, what the advantage of it um, is primarily what I mentioned, where they can get legislation proposed that's essentially ready to go. Uh, and in the past, when you've had these study committees, the legislative members, often one or more of them, will sponsor the draft legislation proposed by the task force or study committee. Um, but I, I don't know on the voting, non-voting dynamic. Um, that, that's something new to me, at least in drafting these. Okay, Representative Walsh. I have a couple of questions, but maybe they're better suited for the uh, sponsors rather than for Damien. Uh, was there any consideration of the size of this task force? Um, so the, there was discussion about that. One of the reasons why that wasn't specified in here is um, last year's discussion in the committee, uh, there was a lot of debate and discussion about which uh, groups that had historically experienced discrimination should be represented. Um, and I think the sponsors wanted to leave that open so that the committee of jurisdiction could uh, determine the, the final sort of composition after they'd taken testimony. Um, and looking back over the drafts from last year, each draft added new groups um, uh, that people had had highlighted. I think the initial draft, um, you know, started out with uh, the Abenaki and a couple of other groups, and then gradually additional groups were, were added. Um, and so that, I think the question for the sponsors was, you know, if we didn't get to sort of a conclusive idea of what that was last year, does it make sense to specify that now or just uh, leave it open so that the committee of jurisdiction can can figure that out. Well, I can see that being uh, an issue that could involve a lot of a lot of debate uh, because we're not only talking about ethnicity or religion or uh, national origin. We're also talking about people with certain disabilities. Uh, we could have a very wide range of possibilities here. Uh, and, and then I get another question. I guess this is this is going to be good for the committee to be discussing. Is uh, could you accomplish the same thing by having a, a minority number of legislators on the task force who could vote, but they would definitely be fewer than the non-legislative members, and therefore you're ensuring that the non-legislative members really do uh, have a voice. I'm just wondering if that's another approach we could take. That it's absolutely an option. Um, and I have structured uh, task forces and study committees where that's been the case. Um, mm. Where, you know, you may have say six members and two are legislators, one from the House, one from the Senate. And then um, the other four could be a mix of community members and members of the administration or, or some other grouping. Um, so def definitely a possibility. There's, there is a lot of, um, 
a lot of flexibility in how this could be designed. Um, the sponsors specified non-voting, but that's definitely something that, that could change uh, in the amendment process. Yeah, and that's my last bit. Uh, I really would prefer that kind of structure because I think anybody who's involved in all the work that this is going to entail ought to have a voice in the final product. So I would prefer that all task force members have a vote. Thank you. And Damien, to be clear, the, the desired outcome of the task force is to propose what a Truth and Reconciliation Commission would, would look like or a structure that would allow for Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to exist would, look, would, would actually be. Not, so it's, it's not the commission itself, it's the process to get there. That's right. You know, so this, this is the, uh, <laughs> this is, um, you know, sort of the design process for the structure and then the actual construction of that, um, and, and the, the building of, of that, if you think of it as a, as a building to get to the finished product is the actual work of the truth and reconciliation commission or commissions that are then proposed in the legislation and would again require legislative review and approval before they were enacted. One of the um, things that has come up in the past is uh, truth and reconciliation commissions can vary greatly in uh, their scope, um, both in terms of membership, what they're told to look into, how well they're resourced, and that can affect their success. Um, too broad a scope, and the commission may just get buried. Um, too narrow a scope, you may leave people out. Uh, inadequate resources for the scope that's proposed and they may not be able to accomplish their work. Um, too many resources and members and they may just get stuck in sort of a you know, bureaucratic log jam uh, trying to move forward. So there, there are a variety of examples from around the world, some very successful and others not so successful um, that this task force could look at and then sort of develop a model to bring back to the General Assembly. Okay, Representative Murphy, then Kalaki. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I actually really support this idea of um, the voting non-voting split. I think that um, allowing this voice be to the members as designed uh, to bring something to the legislature for a vote. It's not that the legislators don't end up having a vote. I, I really support this concept of assisting a body of um, members be able to design something that really fits their needs and hasn't already been adjusted by folks that may not be as involved and interested um, or certainly aware of what needs to be done. And, and the turn will come for the legislators to vote because this is, as you said, putting together the committee to put together a committee <laughs> and, and it comes to the legislature for a vote. So I just would support this structure of voting non-voting. Thank you, Representative Kalecki. Uh, Chair, I, I need a little uh, clarification. Um, when Representative uh, Colston and Christy were in last week, they said they've been working uh, with some UVM interns and they're doing more work on this to bring it forward to us. But are, are you, is your timeline that this would be because it's now our, our, our committee, and not, it's not them anymore, correct? It's us fleshing this out to make it to crossover. Is that what you're hoping for? Yes, and we'll hear from, we'll, if there is, if there is um, I know that they have legislative aides or interns that are working on this, um, that may be doing some of the research that Damien was talking about, like what ways worked better than others elsewhere. But I, I am not, yet aware of what that research is. Um, and, and part of this right. is, to, is to find out from the sponsors 
um, the other sponsors, you know, Representative Colston and Christie in particular, and to check in with them to see what the status of that work is. Um, I mean, I think in this case, in this case, we're looking at not only f forming this committee to form the commission, but in, you know, deciding how, where the, where the inclusivity is on the bill in terms of making sure the voices of the people who are affected are heard in the creation process as well as, you know, and then, and then to see how that creation process plays out. But, you know, I need to, I need, we need to check in with them to see what the level of research that's being done on their okay. behalf is, right. is like. And, and oh, Damien, when you, when you referred to work last session on this and all the different groups, is that, was that in, a, in our committee or was that in another committee? That was in uh, your committee last session. We got up to draft 2.2 on March 11th of last year. And as you'll all remember, March 13th was our last day in the state house. Okay. Um, and so we had uh, five Abenaki members um, and then individuals with uh, developmental and psychiatric disabilities. Um, uh, two or three other individuals who were disabled. Uh, an individual experience with experience working to implement racial justice reforms, a member of the French Canadian community. Uh, an individual with expertise in the protection of human rights and prevention of discrimination, an individual with expertise in the treatment of psychological trauma uh, within communities or groups, a historian with expertise in the history of the eugenics movement in Vermont, an individual with expertise in restorative justice, uh, and three representatives of major civil society organizations that have historically championed reparatory justice. So um, it, it was a diverse group and that was, that was the latest. So that uh, was 12 different entries, but a total of um, uh, 19 or 20 individuals and that didn't include any legislative members. So that, it was a very large task force. Um, since it's on your screen, do you remember the number on that bill? It didn't have a number. It was um, it was still a drafting request. It was 20-0905. Uh, and I can send Ron the link okay. so that he can post it to the website. I'll just send it to the whole um, Thank you. Yeah. committee right now. It is posted. Oh, it is. Great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Thank you. Okay, Representative Triano, then Walsh. Um, thank you. Um, actually, um, Damien just answered my question as to what the makeup of this committee might look like um, in being involved in a number of uh, committees, initiations of committees. Um, 20 seems a little unruly to me. <laughs> um, you know, I know the climate action <clears throat> bill had 20, but they had a series of sub committees that would do a lot of the work. So, um, you know, I understand the perceived need for them, but 20 is a fairly unruly group and, and then adding on legislators on top of that. So I'm not sure, but the makeup sounds right to me. I mean, I think that those are the folks that need to be heard. Thank you. Right, and that's the balance that we're gonna, you know, seek. I mean, I think it's, it, I, you know, it, that's a knot. <laughs> that's a knot we're gonna tease out or untie um, in this con in this process. Representative Walls. Uh, thank you. I uh, when we were discussing this, <clears throat> excuse me, last March, I did a very quick report on. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that I submitted to the committee back then. 
I'll send it to Ron so it can be shared with the committee again. It's yeah. very brief. It's only a couple of pages long, but it's general terms, what truth and reconciliation committees are and have been, and a couple of examples. So I'll send that out to Ron so it, you can all see it again. Yeah, and, and taking into consideration too, the comments that we just heard from Judy Dow, you know, talking about the difficulty of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the amount of funding that, again, this is the committee to form the commission, you know, how they come up with a, a process. I mean, you know, there's so many pieces of this that are really unanswerable now and really should be out of our bailiwick. I mean, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission at heart is not run by the government. Um, you know, the judge and jury question of, of, of how things should work. Um, but it's not, it's, it's unique to Vermont, um, but it's not necessarily unique to the world. And as, as, as you mentioned, Tommy, there's successes some places and lack of successes. It's a, it's a, Again, it's something that we have to look at models, and that's what this committee would be doing, would be looking at the models that worked. Representative, yeah, and, 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 not, and didn't work as well, yeah. Right. Yes, and in my report, I did mention the one in Maine, since that's relatively close by, and it dealt specifically with the Wabnaki, the indigenous peoples. And Judy Dow made a point of criticizing that process uh, when she testified to us. So th that's, that's part of the learning. We can look at the main example and say, okay, what part of that do we want to do? What part do we don't want to do? I think that's all part of it. Right. And what do we, you know, can we predict in the future what, well, not only not, not, not what we want to see as an outcome. I mean, we would have to take their output if this commission were formed, we have to take their output and then we still have we still have to pass the the enabling legislation that allows it to happen without determining what the outcome of that commission might be right and that again that's a that's not anything we're really comfortable in doing just easily so um representative parsons thanks i just wanted to speak to uh representative triano's point about that being a rather large number for a group of people. Um, I think that is going to be one of the challenges that we have to flesh out in the process because um, as the short form states, it's um, getting members to represent a historically disadvantaged. And uh, in that process, you're almost guaranteed to leave somebody out. Depend, it depends where you're going to stop your, your uh, your date on the history part, you know, so it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, and we have a history of of um, that the people that are affected in the, in the testimony we've already received in the um, on the eugenics apology is people don't trust, you know, the establishment, if you will. And we, we have always had trouble, whether it's when people say, well, you know, can you get people who are making minimum wage to come in and testify? And you're like, well, they're probably working. Or, you know, can, you know, can people, the, the, having some of our indigenous population come in last year and they'll come in again, I hope this year, and testify on this bill, you could palpably feel the pain and the, and, and the distrust that comes with coming into that building and trying to share their story. Um, so there's a lot of that, Joe. There's just a lot of that, that, that you know, who are we going to miss is, is we try to cover as many bases as we can and, and hope that we don't miss um, anyone. And, and if we do, that there's a flexibility somewhere that we can that we can include them and whether that's through. Sometimes we end up with situations in committees where there's a smaller committee, but we make sure that the witnesses that testify are incredibly inclusive. You can have as many test you can have as many witnesses as you can fit into your time frame. 
Um, and that's something that we'll look at too. John, and Chip, you mentioned the, the Climate Commission and I think the way that that was structured was like less people, but more subcommittees, right? Less people at the top and then, and then people doing work below. And we can see what, um, Damien, maybe we can find a flow chart of how that commission was set up just to, just to get an idea of, of um, just what that looked like in a, in, in, as it would look like on a flow chart, you know? So committee, um, next steps on this would be, I think, I mean, I'm interested to hear, you know, from you who you think we need to hear from, um, you know, we, it's a long list of people. Um, and I guess, I guess checking in with the social equity caucus or with representative Colston and Christie would be the next step in terms of what research work is being done to see if it's applicable to this process um, or if it's more applicable to an actual truth and reconciliation process. And then, um, but I guess, I guess, I guess our, our next piece of, of work on this might be to take a look at last year's bill, to take a look at the people that um, we put on that list and then actually start to find out whether or not they're still interested and then we would need to decide like what again how many people um are necessary um and what what structure is necessary in order to make sure that we get to where we want to go with this represent clacky mute thank you I, I... <laughs> <laughs> Too many buttons. Uh, you know, I would appreciate also to hear from uh, Representative Donahue on this. She has brought a lot of wisdom around um, psychiatric disabilities, and it's a field she's she's worked in and has lived experience with it. And you know, she, so I, I think that she has a she's done a lot of thinking about this issue from that perspective, and done a lot of writing that she's written a lot about it. Uh, so if, if we, you know, ask other people to come in, I, and I can talk to her separately and I can send her a draft of our bill for input. But um, anyway, I, I benefit from her thinking on this. Sure. And she'll, I'm no, I'm no she'll testify on JRH2 as well um, as, a, as a previous sponsor. Um, of the bill 10, 12 years ago. And as a, as a voice, uh, I don't know if you caught that from, from folks that, you know, she's been an editor of a newspaper for many years called Counterpoint, which is a voice of the um, disabled disability rights community. And so, um, but we'll, yeah, we'll definitely call her in and see where she can lend her expertise, whether it's on this bill, which I think is, is key, but also on JRH too. Um, all right, other comments for Damien? Um, questions? All right, seeing none. Joe, one more? I just, yeah, I just, if you could, Damien, just the, that framework of that I, we had spoke about earlier, I would be curious to know if that has ever happened before, if this would be a, a first. I, of, I, of, I, having, uh, of having the legislators, of having the legislators be non-voting? Yeah, non-vote. Yeah. Okay. I'll reach out to my colleagues to see if anyone's ever, uh, ever done that in the past. Um, and I'll let you know what I hear. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, the, um, so let's put a P 
period stop on H96 for now.